Lord, we are reminded of the words of Scripture that the laborers build without you as the foundation, without seeking your blessings, they build in vain. So, Lord, I do ask for your blessings upon us, upon our work, what we strive to do, what we hope to do. Lord, we offer it up to you, seeking that you would take what we do and perfect our efforts, that they might be of some benefit to those whom we seek to care for. Lord, as people who seek your blessing, then I also ask for the gift of wisdom that we might know your will so that we don't just simply ask for you to bless what, what, whatever we seek to do. But Lord, we would know what you are doing in the world. I'm also mindful on this occasion that if we are not dead, we are not done. And there's always something that you call us to do, something that you call us to enjoy in this world. And so we also pray for Sam. We are very thankful for his career, his work, and for this next stage of his life. Lord, now I ask simply that you would be, that you would be in our midst that as we celebrate all that, that there is to celebrate in this occasion, that we would honor you as well. Amen. It's my pleasure to introduce our honored speaker today, Mr. Sam Deaver. Sam received a bachelor's degree from Peru State University in Nebraska, and he is himself a Spartan. He graduated from our Master of Business Administration program. Much of his work life was spent in the banking industry, and he served as chairman, president, and chief executive officer of Harvest Savings Bank. And I, what some might consider to be a second career started in 2002 when he joined the University of Dubuque as a teaching, part of our teaching faculty. However, I think those of us who've had the opportunity to work with Sam know that it's not second in terms of his investment, that over the last 10 years, he, is, he has invested in significant ways in this as his calling. And that's what's been evident to those who've had a chance to work with him. Sam has been known as someone who is a great colleague, I know that his colleagues in the business department are going to miss him tremendously because he brings a very gentle and positive spirit to everyone that he meets. And he also is committed to engage pedagogy. And one of the things that he's done very significantly with our business students is provide them with an opportunity for a very interesting experience through a simulation that every business major knows about very well, <laughs> maybe too well. <laughs> but most of all, what he represents is someone who has invested in students and, and it takes a particular delight in seeing his students succeed. And so we have been privileged to have Sam a part of our community for the last 10 years and it's a privilege for me to introduce today our last lecture, lecture speaker, Mr. Sam Deaver. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ward. I, I really uh, appreciate that uh, kind introduction. And I'd like to thank the Student Governing, uh, Government Association for giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. And, and thank you all for, for coming. You know, as I, uh, I near my retirement, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the people and the events that uh, have had a significant impact on my life. So today, I'd like to introduce you to some of those people and some of the ideas that they shared with me that uh, seem to have served me, at least from my perspective, uh, relatively well. And um, it all started with uh, the, the people that I think that influenced me the, the, the most were my mother and father, Leland and Aline Deaver. While they are not with us on this earth anymore, they certainly are with me in spirit. Um, they um, taught me how to be, I should be honest, hardworking, and they, they were the two of the hardest working people I've ever, ever met, and showed me the virtues of that. But they were also very humble people. You didn't hear um, them talking about um, the successes they had or blowing their own horn. They basically uh, 
that's not the approach they took to life. In fact, I remember my dad telling me something that kind of stuck with me. It's just, he said, you know, you can learn a lot about people by listening to what they don't say about themselves. And that kind of stuck with me. And that's kind of the way they, uh, they lived their life. I tried to uh, emulate that as best I, I could, uh, but there are times that I've certainly failed in that, that regard, but it did have a, a big impact on me. But I think the most important thing that they did that for me is they introduced me to God and uh, taught me how to love my Savior. And that has had a tremendous impact on my life and will always uh, be first and foremost in, in my life. So I was very blessed with my parents. Um, they <clears throat> uh, were, were great, uh, and, and I learned so much from them. I've also been very blessed to, to have my wife, Sue, who's with us today here uh, by my side. She's my best friend. Um, I often tell people I, the one thing that I enjoy most uh, is coming home from work. And it's kind of a ritual around the house, and we, we just sit down and talk about sharing our days, what happened this day and that. And it's the highlight of my day. It always has been, and uh, she's my best friend. So. Thanks, dear. Uh, at any rate, <clears throat> um, yeah. uh, Sue and I were both married to others prior to us finding, finding each other, and we were both blessed with two children, each from prior marriages. So I wanted to introduce you to, um, this is the Deaver side of the clan. My youngest daughter is the one on the far left, Tanya. My uh, oldest daughter, Kimberly, the third from the right, with their husbands and, and grandchildren. Um, I'm so proud of them all uh, and uh, hopefully have uh, taught them a little bit. I know they've taught me a lot of things uh, along the way, uh, some good and not all of them necessarily that, but, <clears throat> but at any rate, I'm so proud to be, have them in, in my life. And I'm also proud to, that I have two uh, stepchildren, a stepdaughter and a son. And this is uh, Sue's side of the, the family and, and some of the grandchildren. We weren't able to get them all rounded up here. But um, uh, the family is, is a, a source of inspiration to me, a source of strength, um, and always has been. And I hopefully I can serve it as that to them too. They certainly have impacted me a lot. But you know, as I was preparing for this, I got to thinking about just how fortunate I am to be standing here today and how improbable of an event that really was. When I look back at high school, um, I don't remember once ever con even considering going to college. It just wasn't in, in the cards. I wanted to be a mechanic. And I love cars still like this today. And, and I did try that for, out for a while with International Harvester. But, and then an event happened in, in my life that uh, kind of changed things. Um, I uh, ended up uh, basically uh, going into the Army. My, I, well, in high school, I graduated uh, or uh, joined a National Guard unit. And shortly after high school, I went to my active duty and then with, was activated for a couple years in the active Army. And I, when, in, when I was in the Army, I was, uh, came down on orders for drill sergeant school. <clears throat> And now, most of you, when you think of the drill sergeant with the smoky bear hat, it's somebody to be feared. <clears throat> well, I quite frankly don't know how anybody would fear this guy. A <clears throat> 100 pounds less and with hair, but um, <clears throat> you know, I don't know if I was ever really uh, put the fear of God into anybody there. Um, and, but you know, one of the things that we did as, as a drill sergeant, we were always trying to project this command image. And I need to call on, on Jesse James here, the next military person, or I don't know if Bob Roas was able to make it, but uh, to find out if I was really very successful at that. Uh, in looking at this photo, when I dug it out of one of our old cycle books, I, I questioned that, but uh, maybe I shouldn't ask you that, uh, Jesse, but at any rate, um, I did find the experience as a, as a drill sergeant to be a very interesting one. Uh, one, it gave a young kid that didn't have a lot of confidence in themselves. It, um, you know, I, I, I gained confidence in, in that capacity. And it did one other thing that had a tremendous impact on my life. The, the Army had a program where you could get out of the service 90 days early if you'd go to college. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Now, I would like to sit here and tell you that the reason I went to college was to, uh, you know, to gain that learning that I was looking for, but quite frankly, I got tired of getting up at 4.30 in the morning and not getting home until 9 o'clock at night, so I jumped at the chance and uh, went to Peru State uh, as a business administration major, and uh, it was an experience that uh, I can relate to as far as our, our students here at the University of Dubuque in, in two cents. And one, nobody from my family had gone to, to college, so this was a new experience for me. We didn't really know what, what to ex expect. Um, and uh, so that was great. And then and the other thing is, I was married at the time, I had two, two young children, and I, I had to, to work uh, while I was, a lot while I was in college. So I worked at a canning factory from 3.30 to midnight, five days a week. And, um, you know, so I can relate to our students then, because a lot of ours, as you well know, uh, are working a lot of hours. And uh, it's a tremendous sacrifice on, on their part. So I can re relate to them in that respect. But um, even though the reason might not have had the best motives for being in college, I ended up there. That's probably why Jeff has never asked me to be a poster boy for to, uh, in the recruiting part of the, the business there. Or Jesse, I could really help you out there, but, but at any rate, um, I ended up in college and it ended up being a good experience for me. And while there, I uh, took some classes under a professor named Dr. Schneider. He was an economist. And uh, Dr. Schneider uh, took an interest in, in me, um, basically, and he taught me a lot of things. He, you know, he, he, he told me, Sam, you ought to really be setting your sights higher than what I was, was looking for. And he had, had his confidence that he showed into me, and to me really helped me a lot in gaining the self-confidence that, you know, that, that will serve you well. So, and he's one of the main reasons why I really wanted to come to UD and teach, because um, he touched me greatly. And I thought, boy, if I could just do that for one student, hey, this would really be a great experience. Now, I've got four or five here in the front here that would say, hey, he's touched me, but it's not exactly that, probably. <laughs> but, but at any rate, <laughs> yeah, you guys well know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> but, uh, but at any rate, that's, that's, uh, the experience at college was, was, a, was really a, a, a good one for me. After I, I, I left there, um, <clears throat> I um, went to my uh, first job, basically, as in the, worked in the savings loan business. And that was, at the time, basically, they, it was like a bank, but they pretty much just made mortgage loans. And I was a mortgage loan officer. So I started to work there. And I remember about a year after I started, my, my, the president of the bank called me in and, and said, Sam, he says, I've um, applied for a branch office in this little town of Auburn, Nebraska. This guy's name was, was Dwayne Hall. And um, he said, I'd like you to run that branch. And he, he told me, he said, um, you know, I've, I've leased this facility down there. It's going to need some extensive remodeling. And what I would like from you is develop a plan to remodel that, that, that facility and how much it's going to cost. Then he said, put together a business plan of what you're going to accomplish and how you're going to do it down there and, um, <clears throat> and a budget. Submit that to me. And once it's approved, he said, I'll get out of your hair and then invite me to the opening. Well, here, just, you know, young man here, I, I, I thought, wow, this guy, I, I couldn't believe the confidence he had in me. Certainly, I didn't have that much confidence in me, but <clears throat> he believed in me. And he, you know, and, and so we, we did, we got the thing uh, opened up and uh, everything went, went really well. But <clears throat> what he taught me there was, was this, that if you show people that you really, truly believe in them, have confidence in them, very few of them will let you down. They just won't. I would have walked on coals for this guy before I would have, have failed. And, you know, it, it had a big impact on, on me and on the way I viewed my relationship with people that I, I work with. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's served me very well today. So I, I thank Duane for that, that uh, lesson early on in my career. I left there after, well, I opened another branch for him and then left after a couple years and joined a, a larger institution in, in Des Moines, still as, as a branch manager. And I worked for a really great guy there by the name of Chuck Bird. Um, and uh, I remember I opened an office in, in Clinton, Iowa. It was a new office to, to, 
to this uh, institution. They didn't have a branch there uh, at all. And <clears throat> I remember about a week after I started, I was sitting in the car with Chuck Bird out in front of this building that they were uh, remodeling for our branch. It wasn't completely finished. And Chuck basically said, Sam, I said, I'd like you to develop, um, tell me what your goals are for uh, your career for the next year, five, 10, 20 years out, till you retire. What is it you want to accomplish? And he said, alongside that, I'd like to know what you want to accomplish in your personal life. And boy, this, you know, I thought, okay. And what I found was, and I, I put that formal document together, and I still get it out to this day and, and take a look at it every once in a while. It, it's needed some updates and modifications along the way, but it served me really well. And, and basically what it, it showed to me was that, hey, goals are a great way to motivate people, not only me, but others, because it does give them direction, does energize them. And so it was, it was a, a wonderful lesson that I learned early on about in dealing with, with, with people, and uh, myself in, in, as well as, as, as others. So that was a, a good lesson I, I learned from, from uh, Chuck. Also, that um, in the car that day, after we talked about that, he said, there's one other thing I want from you. And he said, I would like you to, to lay out what it is that you want your reputation to be. What do you want to be known for? What do you want a legacy to be when you, when you do retire or whenever down, down the road? Uh, not just when you retire, but, but at any time throughout in your life. And I, I said, okay, Chuck, why are you really uh, asking about that, I don't quite understand. And basically said, he felt that, hey, if, Sam, if you write that down, this is what you want to be known for. He said, then it's gonna be your responsibility to leave your, lead your life to earn that. He said, reputations aren't given out, you know, they're, they're basically earned. And Chuck really believed that <clears throat> character is the foundation that reputations are built on. And I remember the first time I was introduced to the, the, the Winter Initiative and the, the character building immediately, uh, this guy came to mind here because he believed that and I think there's a lot to be said for that. It's, uh, um, it's, it's at least something that I've never forgot, not that I have always lived up to the reputation I, I want to, but it certainly was a great guiding light, I guess, to, to, to follow as I went through uh, my life though, and uh, did ho ho hopefully help me develop that character uh, just a little, little bit at any rate. And Chuck gave me one other lesson. I remember one day I was in uh, the headquarters office and go, went into his office and I was complaining about something. I don't even remember what I was bitching about, but I was going on and on about something and Chuck finally said, Sammy says, I really appreciate you bringing this to my attention. But he said, what I don't appreciate is I haven't heard one word out of your mouth on how you're gonna fix any of that. <clears throat> and, and I thought, you know, yeah, yeah, this, 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 I found that to be kind of a profound experience. One, he put me in my place real, real quick, but he basically was telling me that, yeah, let's not spend our time bitching and complaining about things, let's, try, let's spend our time fixing problems. So uh, that was the lesson, another one I learned from Chuck. Don't complain unless you, um, you have a solution to that. And I would imagine if, if you uh, talk to anybody that, especially in the banking industry that I, that I worked with, uh, they will tell you they heard that come from my lips a, a number of times. Um, but at any rate, I think it, it, um, it's a good way to look at things. At least it served me uh, very well. In fact, I'll talk to you in a few minutes about how it, it changed my life in, in some ways, at least career-wise. <clears throat> so at any rate, that was, I had a great boss there, and I learned a lot of things from him. And from that institution, I, I came to Dubuque as a marketing director back in the, in the savings and loan business uh, again here. And um, oh, two to three years after I joined this company, it got into severe financial difficulty. Uh, it was broke. Uh, not a good thing for a bank, <laughs> you know. Uh, they had negative net worth. Uh, they owed more than they own. And the only reason it wasn't closed up is that in the savings and loan business at that time in the early 80s, there were tremendous amount of problems. And the federal deposit insurance didn't have enough money to deal with them. 
So we had some time, but I was worried about you know, my job, about the company, and, and so I thought about and started looking around for a different job, and somehow uh, one of our board of directors found that I was looking and basically told the president of the bank that, hey, I, I'd like you to set up a meeting so that uh, Deaver can come in here and tell us, I'd like to hear why he's leaving. So uh, you know, I thought, okay, uh, that sounds like an opportunity for me. I'd, I'd go in there and really not expecting a lot. But then I got to thinking about what Chuck told me. Don't be complaining about something unless you've got um, a, a plan to fix it. Well, I had these ideas running around in my head. If I were running this place, this is what I'd do. But it, I hadn't formalized them. So uh, I decided, I, you know, I better do that in case I'm asked. What would you do? And I remember a UD graduate. David Horseman worked in our accounting department, a CPA. He spent the weekend with me because I had these ideas that sounded really great, but uh, I don't, from a financial perspective, they needed to, to be tied together a little bit, and David helped me with that. And so when I was, did go before the board, sure enough, after I got done telling him why I was, was, was leaving, they said, well, what would you do about it? So I got a chance to share my plan with them. Well, that, is basically where I learned that, hey, problems sometimes are opportunities waiting to be solved. And uh, this was a great opportunity, uh, for, for me anyway, because uh, shortly thereafter I was asked to lead that organization and try to uh, return it to profitability before the regulators did have the, the funds that was necessary and they wouldn't close us up, basically. So it, it was a, a great opportunity. I thought, well, you know, I, I've got my plan here and I, I need to share that uh, with, with my management team and, and the staff, but I also need to lay out what the vision of this place, what I think it could look like in five or six years. So I tried to do that, and I remember the this, this staff meeting one night to introduce that to them, but this was not a publicly held company. This was a private at all, so three-fourths of the staff if not more, really didn't have any idea that we were broke. And, and so I, I thought this needs to be shared with them. But at the same time, I laid out, you know, this is the plan that I, I believe if we put a lot of hard work in, and a tremendous amount of commitment and some luck, you know, we can, we can make this thing work and we can achieve this down, down the road. But I, I did indicate that it was going to take a tremendous amount of commitment. And it was going to mean that our company had to change the way we were doing business dramatically. And you know as well as I do, change is sometimes difficult for us to, to accept. And I found a, a, a story that I stole from somebody. I didn't create it, but it worked well for me and I used it several times since. And I um, give the analogy that that company and we as the employees of it, we're in kind of like we're in a... Uh, train uh, sitting in the, in the train station, ready to get up and head on our journey that we're going to leave, leave on tonight. And they said there were probably 10, maybe 15% in the, in the employees there that thought, wow, this is great. It's about time management's doing something about things around here, and, and you're already on board, ready to get, get things rolling. And that's wonderful. They said there's probably another 60, 70 percent of you that are saying, hey, Sam, I kind of like your plan, but hey, we've heard this stuff before. Management comes up with these wonderful ideas and 30, 60, 90 days later, they're off on another tangent. And so, uh, and I said, I understood that and, and I respect their, their feelings on that. And I said, that's perfectly fine. Because this locomotive, as you know, takes time to get up to speed and before we can really get rolling. So why don't you just kind of walk along and observe what's going on in the next three or four months and see if you think management is really uh, committed to this and willing to apply the, the resources to it. If they are, you can still get on board. I said, but there's probably another 10 or 15% of you or so that are saying, hey, Sam, this isn't what I signed on for. I don't think I'm able to give you this commitment. Or for whatever reasons, and I, I understand that and I respect your, your decision. So why don't you take the next three to four months and look for an opportunity elsewhere if it's not here for you. And, and that will be in your best interest and ev everybody's. And so I, I uh, encourage you to do that. I give you my best wishes. That's fine. 
But I said, what isn't fine is, and it's not in anybody's best interest here, is we're going to start this train rolling tonight, and we're going to build up steam. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to get in front of the train. <clears throat> and uh, I used that, and I know my management team, a lot of them have used it in times of change, and I think why I like it so much, it, it gives people kind of an out, uh, and it's a lot to expect people to em embrace radical change uh, quickly, but, um, and it gives them a chance uh, to, to see is, is, are their leaders really true to what they're, they're saying. And boy, with this group, it was a commitment I couldn't, we got commitment that I couldn't hardly believe. They, not only did they turn this, this company around profitability-wise, they made up for a good share of the net worth that was lost. We weren't broke anymore, at least. We were woefully undercapitalized. Regulators still weren't happy. But, um, so we decided, well, we gotta raise some capital quick, because if we don't, they're gonna, they're gonna um, uh, close us up here. So we decided to do an IPO, initial public offer, stock offering, and uh, to raise this capital. And part of the one aspect of that, uh, we decided to do what, uh, buy a significant portion of the company's stock in this offering and put it in the form of an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan. And the reason we wanted to do that was these were the people that saved this company, that brought it back from the brink. They were also the people that were going to create future wealth, and they should basically have an opportunity to share in it. So we hired an investment banker, and we set out on this uh, uh, intense six-month journey to sell this stock. Well, it was the world's worst time to, to do a stock offering, the savings loan business was every day where it seemed like we were in the headlines because the stock, the taxpayers may have to bail this thing out. The losses were so bad. We had a bunch of crooks in the industry, quite frankly, as, as it was deregulated that entered it. It was not an easy sell. We had hired investment bankers uh, and those Wall Street types did a great job of taking our money and sold no stock, hardly any. <clears throat> The people that sold the stock were the employees of the bank who spent their nights and weekends out selling their message to anybody and everybody that would, would listen to them. And by gosh, they, we, we created or completed that stock offering. And I remember at the time thinking back of where we'd been and where we were at and that <clears throat> I was amazed at the commitment that uh, uh, people had towards this end. And what they sh showed me through their, their actions was that if you really want enduring commitment like these folks had exhibited over a number of years, it requires you to be very passionate about what you do. When I advise my students here at the University of Dubuque, I say the most important thing, I, advice I can give to you is find what you're passionate about. That's what a lot of the undergraduate experience should be about. And then follow that passion. Oh, I'm worried about my student loans and things. Follow the passion, the money will follow. Pursue your passion, the money will, will follow. And <clears throat> these folks that I had the privilege of, of working alongside of and observing, boy, were, were they, passionate about what, what they, they did. We did, we completed the offering, the company did very well. We went on and continued to, to generate uh, good returns for our stockholders. In fact, to, to the point that our board of directors were presented an offer to purchase the company for, uh, we initially uh, had uh, sold the stock at $10 a share and when you account for stock splits and things of that nature, five years later we had received an article, uh, an offer to, to buy us for a few cents under $100 a share. Ten, about 10 times what, what uh, they uh, were initially sold for. And our board of directors, quite frankly, didn't feel they could, had, could turn it down and, and still fulfill their fiduciary responsibilities to the stockholders. So we did sell the company. But one of the things that was in this um, ESOP when we created it was a kicker that if the company is ever sold, all of the stock that hasn't been distributed to the employees would be immediately distributed. So between the ESOP and we, a lot of our folks had stock options and about all of them had bought some stock even if it wasn't for a few shares. 
it was a, a financial boon to all of us, like none of us have really uh, experienced since, probably, and, and, and may not uh, again. But, um, and it brings me kind of, if, if, if I could get on my high horse a little bit here, last week CNN reported that of the S&P 500 companies, the largest uh, uh, publicly traded companies, in 1980, the CEOs were basically paid 42 times what the average their employees were paid. Today, they're paid 354 times what the average is. The good news is that in 2000, that was at, peaked at 525 times. But we are the only country in the world that I know of that pays its CEOs anything like that multiple of what the average earner is making. And I would suggest that the boards of directors of some of these large publicly held companies and the CEOs could learn a lot from the people that I was fortunate to work with in, in, in the fact that, hey, you can generate a lot more value for your share, shareholders if you would just basically uh, be more willing to share the wealth with those who created it. <clears throat> and anyway, that's I, something I've, I've often felt very strongly about because I got to observe what these folks did. It was just, you know, remarkable to me at any rate. <clears throat> uh, but um, <clears throat> enough about the, the, the banking thing. Uh, uh, when after, after the bank was sold, I, I didn't stick around too long and eventually made my way here to uh, the University of, of Dubuque and was given this opportunity, which I have found to be tremendously challenging. Uh, as challenging as anything I've ever faced, but also one that uh, is very, very, very rewarding, at least uh, to me and I, I know to those that, that work here. I think you share that, that, uh, the feeling about it. And, I, and I, what I've, I've found here also that the students here at University of Dubuque aren't really much different than the people that I worked with in, in banking, with maybe one exception. In banking, we got an opportunity to hire who we wanted to work with. Then it was our responsibilities as managers and leaders to use the resources that we had at our disposal to help them develop to their full potential. Here at University of Butte, the students choose, choose us. That's a different dynamic. And when you couple that with the mission that we're on here and reaching out to students that maybe wouldn't have normally gone to school, that creates some unbelievable challenges for the, the teachers, the administrators, and the, the staff here. How do you bring those students that aren't as well prepared as we would like, how do you bring them along so they can develop their learning and, their, uh, and, and graduate? How can you do that at the same time as you have your students who are well prepared for the experience? How do you keep them challenged and bring, keep them in the, in the game? Well, I found that to be t unbelievably challenging, and I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> you know, that's why I'm retiring now, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but I do know this. I do feel very strongly about this. Eleven years ago, when I, I came here, you know, we were on that same mission, and we're doing it a lot better today than we were then. And while we've got a ways to go, um, you know, it, it, uh, we've, we've made a lot of progress. I liken it to the total quality revolution that business went through in the 80s and continues to this day, where continuous improvement is the norm. And that's the way it is, as you well know, here at, here at University of Dubuque. Not only for our students, but for us as, as faculty members uh, as, as well. And that's what I guess I like so much about this position here, is every semester I get a chance to modify how I approach things, the materials I, I, I use, uh, the way I teach uh, in, that, in a, an attempt to continually try to improve. Some of the things work better, some of them don't. But you, you're always trying to do that. And that's what I appreciate about this job more than, than anything else. And one of the things I feel strongly about, and I know you that work here also share this, is that we have a responsibility to prepare our, prepare our students to basically to assume leadership roles in our society. 
And so I've got a few comments about leadership that I'd like to leave you with that, that I've learned from others and are observed and they've served me, I think, relatively well and maybe you'll find something uh, that uh, you can identify with or might be helpful to you, I, I certainly hope for. And the first thing relative to, to leadership I would suggest is if you're going to be a leader, look for the best in people. It's too easy to sit there and find fault and this is so-and-so's weaknesses. Look for the best. Spend time to get to know your people well enough to you know what their great qualities are. And that's what you need to build on. And once you know them to the, uh, who your people are, then basically take and match their skills, their emotional characteristics that they, they may have. And <clears throat> whatever their motivations might be, match those two positions that really require that. You don't ever want to put somebody in a position to fail. That does nothing but destroy their self-confidence. You're not accomplishing what you want. So I think good leaders are the ones that get to know their people well enough to know, hey, I, I think this is an area where you can excel in and you can grow in. Because as a leader, that's one of your responsibilities, is how do you make your people grow and develop and, and blossom, if at all possible here. <clears throat> um, the, the next thing, the comment about uh, leadership I'd make, and I identify um, <clears throat> Lee with the Wint Center again, and that's the, the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I think this serves us so well in our interactions with, with people but I would suggest to you that if, as a true leader, you need to take that a step farther than that. And the reason is because we are all different. If I treated my wife the way I want to be treated, I'd get batted inside the head probably. <clears throat> you know, she has different, excuse me, dear, different <laughs> uh, uh, personality and she reacts differently to different situations. People that, when I was in banking, uh, I can especially identify to some of the senior officers that I was with, each of them, to get the most um, out of them, uh, that's a heck of a way to say it, but to, to encourage them to blossom, to uh, achieve, to get to their best potential, you needed to manage them and lead them based on what trips their trigger. And it, one blanket way of doing it, I learned the hard way, didn't work. Uh, you needed to, to focus on individual characteristics here. And so I would suggest to you, maybe we can modify that in certain situations a little bit to read, hey, why don't we treat others as they want to be treated? Might serve us better in, I think, in, in some respects, at least in some, situ excuse me, some situations, because people are different and they want to be treated differently. And we need to find that what it is that they want. Whether it's our family, or whether it's our business associates, I still think it makes a lot of sense and can serve, uh, serve us well. It, it certainly uh, did me at, at any rate here. Um, <clears throat> the other comment I'd like to make about leadership, I think <clears throat> this picture says an awful lot. <clears throat> What it tells me, at, at any rate, is, you know, if you're going to be a, a leader and you want people to follow you, they have to trust you. Because if they don't trust you, <clears throat> they're going to spend their time watching their back. They're going to have to do it themselves because you're not looking out for their best interest. So you need to trust your leaders to, to always do that for you because if you're not you're not spending your time as, as you hoped you, you could. And in today's world where things are changing at mock speed, creativity is extremely important. How can you be creative if you're watching your back? To me, that's tough. How can we uh, achieve the mission here, successfully achieve it here at the University of Duke, of bringing those that folks that aren't maybe as well prepared as we would like them to be into college, how do we successfully get them through graduation? Uh, how, do, how do, can we do that uh, in, you know, here and, and I, I, without being very creative? The same old way of doing things, just as you all know, doesn't work. 
And we've made a lot of progress in that because we've been very creative and been open to trying new things, putting our resources behind it. And <clears throat> so I think um, <clears throat> creativity is, is something that uh, tremendous loss if we don't trust those who are our, our leaders. So I think that's, that's very important. But <clears throat> trust in and of itself, I don't think, um, is the total picture. In addition to trust, we need to have confidence in our, in our leaders, an enduring type of confidence that is backed up by not words, but by, by actions. I like this cat. <clears throat> this cat, as, as you know, yeah, he's got some courage and confidence here. In fact, I thought about seeing if I could get this person to run for Congress. It might be an improvement, I don't know, but at any rate, Confidence, an enduring type of confidence that stays with us is basically achieved through the actions, not the words that you or I espouse. And so as these are just some of the thoughts I had regarding leadership and, and hopefully maybe they would be of uh, some use to you. I, I think they, they have to me at times at, at any rate. So in closing, I guess I, I sincerely like to thank all of you that I've worked with, the staff, the faculty, and the administration here at UD. You've been wonderful. Uh, I have learned so, so very much from, from all of you. Uh, thank you for sharing that knowledge with me. It's, it's had a tremendous impact on me. For the students, you know, I, I hope that you have learned much while you're here at the University of Dubuque. I know I have learned so much from the students that I share class with and uh, just the interrelationship with you, it, it's been, been wonderful. But when you leave University of Dubuque, I hope you will remember one thing, and that is that the learning is just beginning. Uh, most of the things that I highlighted on the screen today weren't learned in college. They were learned after college. So the learning just begins. So I encourage you to seek out opportunities for new learning. Never, never stop. Um, and I think you will be very, very well prepared to handle the challenges that life will throw at you. Uh, I know I feel very confident in the younger generation and it's one of the, the pleasures of working here being exposed to you all. So I thank you very much and I wish you all the very, very best. Thank you. Thank you.